How to Cook Well with Rory O'Connell Proudly sponsored by Kerrygold I love cooking and I love teaching people how to cook. Good food is so important, not just for our health, but for our temperament, and it doesn't need to be complicated. For this series, I've created a set of menus which I hope you will try, either as individual dishes or as a complete and balanced meal. We're so lucky to have some of the best raw ingredients in the world. Let's make the most of them. Welcome to my new series with lots of new recipes and techniques. Recently, some of you will have been growing your own fruit and vegetables and how absolutely wonderful to be able to use some of that produce in your own kitchen. The more we understand where our food comes from, the more we appreciate the effort that goes into us and the more we cherish it. Today I'm going to cook brill, one of my favourite flatfish. The brill will be served with a roast chicken sauce. It sounds like an odd combination, but trust me, it works really well. Then there's a ginger and lemon cake made extra special with the addition of fresh turmeric. Do try and find this ingredient. I promise you, you'll be amazed. I'm going to start with a dish which combines hot smoked salmon with the easiest homemade cheese you will ever make. Also, a beautiful, vibrant, green, peppery watercress oil. So even though the assembly of this dish is very easy and kind of fun at the last minute, there is a little bit of preparation to be done ahead of time. That's preparing the watercress oil, which I'll start with, and then the labneh. But that could all have been done yesterday or even actually a couple of days ago. So um, I've got a liquidizer. You could use a handheld blender for this, but actually the liquidizer gives you a finer result. I'm using lovely watercress. Another day it might be basil, it might be chives. Uh, coriander would be very good as well. So simply put your oil, and that's, I'm using a sunflower oil. You could also use a grapeseed oil there, which is lovely and neutral in flavor. And then just put what looks like a lot of watercress into the liquidizer. And then, as you'll see, we're going to drip that through muslin. Okay, so. That's lovely now. It looks like a smooth puree. And don't forget to just take a little smell. The smell of the fresh watercress when it's broken like that is absolutely fantastic. Then, this then, I'm going to drip through a little bit of muslin. This is a little bit of butter muslin. You buy it at a haberdashery or a, or a, a fabric shop, and you can use it over and over again. And it will obviously won't be as beautifully white each time you use it as this new piece but no reason not to use it. Kind of an odd technique, isn't it? But it's just so, so useful. Then, a little bit of string. There's definitely strings attached here. Good tight knot, actually several knots really. Now you see, we're already starting to get a sort of a rather a lovely looking oil, but that will become beautiful and clear, sort of like Kelly green. So we're going to hang that up there. And that's all you have to do with that, but make sure, of course, that is dripping into the bowl. I'm going to do the labna next. And here, when you make labna, you go from someone who has bought yogurt or maybe even made your own in a couple of hours to becoming actually a cheesemaker because we're making a very simple yogurt cheese. And this is lovely, um, really beautiful sort of thick yogurt here. And you can see even there's a little bit of cream has risen to the surface, almost like butter on top of the yogurt. It's absolutely fantastic. I mean, isn't it just glorious? Then, similar thing, four corners together. Now, the labna would be brilliant with the watercress and the hot smoked salmon, but then labna, I mean, it's a flavor that associates wonderfully with all of those Middle Eastern spices, um, slow roast shoulder of lamb, or just with roast peppers to make a beautiful meat-free dish. And then we leave this for a minimum, I'd say, of four hours. So you could do this the first thing in the morning, if you're planning that evening, or else leave it overnight. And again, this just gets hung up like that. Now, here is one I did last night. And you can see quite clearly what I have here. I've got the whey and I've got the uh, dripped yogurt. And that I'm going to decant into a little bowl. Then to extract that, it couldn't be easier, and you have this really sort of glorious cheese. I mean, you've become a cheesemaker. Isn't that just completely fantastic? 
you don't get an awful lot in terms of what you started with, but you get fabulous flavor and a thing that has so many different uses. Now, back to our watercress oil. That's dripping away there slowly. The next stage of that technique, when it's dripped ideally overnight, you put that into the deep freeze. You put the bowl of watercress oil into the deep freeze. And what happens is the oil separates from the water. So then you end up with this beautiful oil and then just pour it like that, leaving the icy water down underneath. That's the preparation ahead for this recipe. After going to the trouble of making that watercress oil, it will keep for a couple of weeks in your freezer. Don't waste a fraction. And I'm just going to put a pinch of salt in there. When those are done, the um, presentation and preparation of the dish is really, really straightforward. Okay, I've got some beautiful hot smoked salmon. So most of the smoked salmon that we know in this country is called cold smoked. So it's smoked for a longer time with a colder heat of smoke. This is hot smoked, so it's got a slightly different texture. It's more like the texture of roast salmon. So to assemble a nice plate, um, I'm just going to do up one sort of starter portion here. This could be lunch, it could be a supper dish as well, maybe accompanied with a little bit of brown bread on the side, or you could almost have a little pot of new potatoes on the side, nice and hot to go with this also. So we start off with the labna, not too much. And then I like to make a little sort of depression but you see the lovely yielding texture of that. Then I'm going to take a little of the smoked salmon and I like to break this with my fingers like that rather than cut it. The salmon is rich, you don't need a lot of it. Then some of our watercress oil, not too much because it's rich, a little dried chili flake and that could quite simply be that. If you had a couple of sprigs of watercress left over, you could garnish it with that. But I'm going to garnish it with a really favorite ingredient of mine today, which are these absolutely wonderful coriander flowers. If you grow coriander, sometimes it goes to flower. And these absolutely exquisite little flowers like that are really delicious here. And of course, you know, they look beautiful as well. So a few of those, it's quite elegant. And this is for me at a certain time of year, the best of Ireland on a place. In the last few months, I've taken to the waters early in the morning and it's completely wonderful. And I feel fortunate that I live in such a beautiful place to be able to do that. And these clean, cold waters are the key to quality fish. And today I'm going to cook brill. It's a wonderful flat fish, maybe not as well known as place and turbot, but brill is wonderful. Pearly white flesh, firm texture, delicious flavor, and it's treat. Now I'm going to begin with the roast chicken butter sauce. And I've got a lovely leftover chicken carcass. This could have been fresh or in the fridge for a couple of days, or it could have been frozen. And I often freeze the carcasses. And I'm going to start off, just sort of break it up just a little bit like that. It seems strange to serve a sauce based on chicken with a beautiful piece of fish, um, which we'll see in a couple of moments. But actually, this combination of using a meat-based or a poultry-based sauce to go with fish has been a part of classic French cooking for a really, really long time. So that's going into our oven. And I have one roasting. I mean, you know, it's all about the joy of getting extra value out of the chicken that you bought. So first even you'd roast chicken, then maybe the next day you'd love chicken sandwiches for lunch. And then you have the carcass to make this sauce or another day you'd make stock out of it. Then that goes onto the heat and I'm going to deglaze this with some white wine. So I've got my white wine measured out, goes straight on. And what the white wine is going to do, apart from flavor the sauce, it's going to lift up any caramelized juices that are sitting on the bottom of the pan. So I like to give that a little bit of a stir, like that. And your wine wants to reduce by half, and that's going to take off the fierceness. And that has happened pretty much now. So that I decant into a saucepan, and we're going to cover that with what looks like a small amount of chicken stock. It doesn't look very exciting, I agree with you, and it seems a little bit odd, but when we put our cucumber and all our other lovely bits and pieces in here, I think you'll really start to understand how it should be absolutely lovely. So 
in with our chicken stock or broth. You see, it's scant. So because it's scant, you need to push it down a little bit. Try and get as much of that chicken underneath the surface. I like to give that about an hour simmering. So it can be just, that can be just ticking away while you're doing other things. Okay, lovely. While that is happening there, and you could have done it yesterday if you wanted to, I am going to fillet my fish. So I've got a beautiful brill um, that I'm using. And this is really a magnificent fish brill, white flesh, um, firm texture. And it is, of course, a flat fish. I like to use a filleting knife, flexible filleting knife like that. Can you see that line there? That kind of gives you a guide as to where you enter with your knife. And I'm going to put my knife in on that and cut from the head down to the tail. Then I just cut across there so that the fillet will come away a little bit more easily. And then just slide your knife along the carcass of the fish and then cut it off like that. And you see, we've lost absolutely nothing there. Again, the bones are your guide. So right out to the edge of the fillet. You can see where my knife is just, just under there, under the edge of the fillet. Push my knife through like that, and then cut that off right out to the frill. Meanwhile, I can hear my stock and my white wine simmering away, making that lovely gurgling sound in the background. Then turn the fish over, and basically we're repeating the process on the second side. All the way down, losing nothing. So I've got my fish fillets, and now I need to skin them in this instance. Sometimes you leave the skin on, and sometimes you take the skin off. Cut through the flesh, just on there like that. See the way it's sort of slightly hinged? And then cut away from you, just removing the skin you want to keep the waist to a minimum. It's being a bit cantankerous there. Lovely. And then what I like to do then is to cut my fish into, because that's too long for one fillet. Generally speaking, if I'm cutting a piece of fish like this, I kind of follow the line of the top of the fillet. And it's more like a sort of a, to my eye anyway, like a fish swimming. Is that complete nonsense perhaps? But you know what I mean. Okay, I'm going to give my hands a little rinse and then we're pretty much nearly ready to cook the fish because I have a little bit of sauce um, at a, a further on stage. How to Cook Well with Rory O'Connell. Proudly sponsored by Kerrygold. For our fish, we have a little bit of seasoned flour. This is the cooking of the fish. That's sort of an old fashioned thing. Every kitchen back in the day would have had a bowl or a, or a plate like this with flour with salt and pepper in it for dipping a piece of liver or kidneys or fish or whatever. And then the other ingredients that we have for our sauce, we have some grapes, peeled and pipped grapes. They can be ready ahead of time. And I've also diced a little bit of cucumber and cucumber and grape work very nicely together. So when your chicken sauce has reduced to about 200 milliliters, then you put that sauce, it's going to be looking slightly reduced, but not too reduced. Again, not looking beautiful at this stage, it has to be said, but don't worry, we'll get that. Um, all will come together nicely in due course. Now, lovely. I've got a little bit of soft butter for smearing onto the fish. You could use a little bit of olive oil if you want to. Whenever I'm frying fish, or most meats for that matter are grilling, I always put the fat directly onto the, the fish that I'm cooking or the meat that I'm cooking rather than put it into the pan because that way you just lose the minimum amount, you use the minimum amount of fat and you get the maximum amount of value out of it. So dip your fish into the seasoned flour. You could use gluten-free flour here, absolutely. Shake off the excess flour and then butter at room temperature. Lovely Irish butter, just on like that. You can butter both sides if you want to. You don't absolutely have to butter both sides, by the way, because by the time the top has melted, it will have left a little and enough of the fat in the pan, the minimum amount, maximum value. Um, it will have left enough uh, of the fat in the pan to prevent the underneath side when you turn it over from sticking. So rather meanly and butter at room temperature. Now, make sure your pan is hot enough before you put the fish into cook. So we'll just 
There we go. In she goes. He, she, it. Lovely. Now, our sauce, to which I'm adding our diced cucumber, about a half a centimeter of peeled diced cucumber, going in there. And we're really just warming through the cucumber. And then we're also going to um, put a little cold butter in here because it is a butter chicken sauce. So a couple little lumps of cold butter. And I'm going to swirl the pan in a moment to emulsify. And that will thicken the sauce ever so slightly. The grapes that we peeled just go in at the last moment because I want those to be completely fresh tasting. Now, let's see what's happening with our fish. You can hear it cooking nicely. Have a little look in. Yeah, see, we got plenty of color. And turn it over like that. Beautiful. I had a little bit of salt and pepper in my flour, so I don't need to season this anymore at this stage. Now, fish nearly cooked. Grapes going in. My herb of choice is tarragon, but failing tarragon at another time of the year, I would use chervil. The grapes at this stage still look translucent, so they haven't really been cooked through. So when you taste them, there's going to be that sweet, fresh, almost raw taste of the grape. The same is almost the case with the cucumber, and that is a very good foil for the richness of the fish. I want my fish just cooked through, just feeling firm to the touch and looking pearly white inside. So this is a nice, sort of a generous portion. You might another day decide that actually it's enough for two people, and that would be fine. Then, a little of the sauce. See the way the cucumber still looks lovely and fresh looking. Don't drown it. Very important never to drown a fish. A few little sprigs of fresh tarragon, a few little new potatoes, a green vegetable with a fish of this quality. Absolute feast and a pure treat and sort of to be treated as such. Lovely. In some recipes, there can be one defining ingredient, and in this cake, it's turmeric. And I'm talking about fresh turmeric. You cannot substitute the dried for fresh in this recipe because the fresh turmeric is just full of incredible aroma and flavor in a way that's perhaps even hard to imagine about turmeric. The turmeric itself doesn't enter the equation until we make the icing. Here, everything goes into the food processor and we give it a very quick quiz, and quick is the important word, and your mixture is ready to go into the oven. So I've got some flour, some self-raising flour, caster sugar, and then the best eggs, as always when you're making a cake that you can get your hands on. Make those in. I mean, this is so simple. This cake is definitely best, I think, eaten on the day it's made. And um, we all know powdered turmeric very well. We may not be quite so familiar with fresh turmeric, but the flavor of fresh turmeric is it's a revelation, I promise you. And the scent, the perfume is really quite remarkable. Now, flour, sugar, eggs, lots of lovely Irish butter. I'm using normal salted butter, which is what I prefer mostly in cakes, unless I'm after a sort of a really particularly French flavor. Then I'll use unsalted, but normally I use um, salted. Lemon, I'm going to zest the lemon. So the combination of lemon and ginger, just absolutely lovely. Then my ginger, again, using the same microplane. Mind your fingers. Now, smell already delicious. Make sure you have everything in. Yes, we do. And a quick quiz. And I usually do this on the pulse button, just so as I can keep a little bit more control. A few seconds like that. A little bit more. That's it. And now it looks like a cake mixture that in a different time, you might have spent 20, 15 or 20 minutes beating. C'est la vie, as I say, time moves on. Now, everything into the tin. One or two good strong spatulas. And to spread that into the tin. Nice and evenly. Lovely. Okay, into the oven. And that's going to take about 25 minutes or so, maybe a little bit longer. Now, I'm going to go to the garden to pick some edible blossoms that we're going to decorate the cake with later. Ah, okay. These are the little ones I'm after. This is um, a variety of marigold, also known as the tragedies. And I use these in sort of sweet and savory situations, but these will be absolutely lovely on the cake today. 
are really easy to grow, super easy. There's loads of different types of marigold, and these are definitely one of the more unusual ones. Okay, here, growing side by side, some lovely little violas, and they'll be lovely, and they'll clash nicely with my marigolds. Really lovely, again, sweet and savoury situations. And then they are growing beside this really wonderful thing, very romantically called Love in a Mist, or Nigella. These are really easy to grow and they spread like that. So um, if you like that sort of informal look in your garden, it could not be nicer. Lovely. Ah, oh, that's really kind of thrilling. Look at those wonderful colors. Fabulous. Okay, so the cake is cool and I'm ready to make my icing. So I've got um, all of my ingredients ready. A um, little icing sugar, which I like to pass through a sieve just to be on the safe side just to um, make sure there are no lumps. There we go. The last little bit in there. And then that's followed by a little cream cheese and a little room temperature butter, like that. Then um, about two teaspoons of lemon juice. So one, very bold. I should get my spoon out to measure too, but I am watching it quite carefully. And then the turmeric. So I'd say most people are very familiar with dried turmeric, which is a wonderful spice. Whenever you're using fresh turmeric, and you can use it almost anywhere in the same way as you use dried turmeric, you just use the same quantity. So it's as simple as that. And the perfume is absolutely astonishing, really, really charming. So I just peel this, and then to reveal the beautiful color of the, um, of the uh, turmeric. And I want one teaspoon of this. And again, I'm going to grate it on my microplane. Be prepared for carroty looking fingers for a couple of days. So that should be that. Okay, I find if I do have turmeric -y fingers, is turmeric -y a word? Anyway, you know what I mean. That um, little lemon juice I find um, works quite nicely. And the beating of the icing is just very, very quick and easy. So this is the point at which you might lose your nerve and decide to add masses more lemon juice, but just keep beating until it comes together. Suddenly it just turns a little corner and you get this lovely creamy um, sort of consistency. Lovely. Okay, now we're ready to ice. So I like to put all of the icing on in one go. And then I'm going to spread this out very simply just out to the edge, not down along the sides. And then I'm going to um, sprinkle on a little crystallized or what's sometimes called stem ginger. So paddling that using a palette knife out to the edge. Lovely. So um, there's ginger twice in this cake. There's fresh ginger in the mixture that we cooked and then there's this stem or crystallized ginger going on top. So it's a lovely sort of gingery hit. So scatter those on and that's got a slightly translucent appearance of the ginger is really, really lovely. Now, back to my little blossoms that we picked a little bit earlier. So the viola, now you may think that this is a bit too carnival or Mardi Gras for you. And if it is, well then you can be much more restrained than I'm about to be, because I have no intention of exercising even the slightest bit of restraint with this particular cake. That's those. Then the lovely, without doubt, screechingly festive marigold. And then a little of the nigella, or the love in a mist. I think enough is enough, definitely enough is enough. So it's lovely, simple, delicious. Eat on the same day, ideally, and then polish off the rest of it tomorrow. To Cook Well with Rory O'Connell. Proudly sponsored by Kerrygold.